From being one of the students, we are now colleagues. We both teach at uh, UCLA Extension at the Writers Program. Um, I was surprised when Mike invited me. I thought I would be one of three or four people sharing. Um, it's a luxury to have a chunk of time if you're a writer to share the work. I'm used to like eight minutes or <laughs> 15 minutes. So I don't know what to do with one hour, but I'll do my best. There really are some seats here, and you may want to be comfortable. Um, I have a kind of a bilingual, back, bicultural background. I was born and raised in the Philippines, but I came to this country for graduate work, and I've been here for a longer time than I was in the Philippines, and so I've got these two cultures going on. A lot of my writing um, is set in the Philippines. And what I'd like to share with you first is um, an excerpt from my first novel. Um, so we're in the Philippines, and it's World War II, and our storyteller is a young girl named Yvonne. Their group uh, that had just arrived in Mindanao, running away from the Japanese, um, found a family, uh, a, doc a doctora, a woman doctor and children, massacred, and they had brought with them the husband, who's also a doctor, <coughs> Doc Menez. And so I'll read that excerpt. Doc was curled up in the corner of the hut, looking like a dark rock. His thick hair was matted with red-brown blood. His face was contorted from the torment he felt in his soul. Doc could not even cry. His eyes were closed, crusted over, and flies buzzed over them. I couldn't help thinking of how he must have felt seeing his family the way he did. The awful memory rose in my mind, and I tried brushing it away. I shook him gently, but he didn't move. I put the bowl of porridge down and moved closer. I pried his eyes open and peered into his pupils. They were glassy, like the eyes of a dead fish. Doc, I whispered, afraid of startling him. His eyes remained devoid of feeling or intelligence. Although he stared straight at me, he did not see me. He pushed me away as though I were one of the pesky flies hovering over him. I finally returned, I finally returned the porridge to lie down and told her that Doc was still sleeping. I checked on him regularly, watching his chest rise and fall to make sure he was still breathing. I had this nagging fear that he would suddenly die right there without our knowing. That would have been very sad. When the man began extinguishing the lamps that night, Doc awoke from whatever daydream he had been in and began screaming for his wife and children. He ran out of the hut and crawled around, clawing at the earth. When the man tried to pull him up, he grabbed a machete and waved it at them. They had to tie him to one of the supporting poles of the hut, and he thrashed about all night, howling and shrieking so that we became fearful that the Japanese would hear him. We found him in the morning, slumped on the ground with blood crusted on his wrists. Nida loosened the manila rope binding Doc. It's too tight, she grumbled. How could they do this to him? Now he's all cut up. Go get some water and a clean rag, one. We washed and changed him. While combing out the tangles in his hair, Nida said, Doc's a good man. He helped Mama and the girls at Slapsy Maxis. She stroked Doc Menezes' hair. A sick person likes to be touched. It's love they need most of all. She paused. I talked to Mama while she was dying and even after she had stopped breathing. The hearing's the last to go, you know. We better let him rest now. Doc lay still for a long time, but a little later he began moaning and Lydon sent me to him with some porridge. He stirred and rubbed his eyes. Doc looked confused as he stared at me. I smiled at him, glad that he was awake. His baffled look lingered. Finally, he spoke, where's your mother? In the kitchen, it's time to eat, I said, offering him the soup. He blinked his eyes and gave a wan smile. His voice softened. I'm glad she's in the kitchen. I am not, I don't feel well. Amalia, call your mother, child. Tell her my head hurts and I feel lousy. He flung one arm over his eyes and forehead. Not knowing what to do, I told the women what happened. Nida volunteered to feed Doc. 
When she approached Doc, he stared at her. At first, he appeared confused. Then very swiftly, his eyes flashed in anger. Doc swung his bound hands at Nita, knocking down the porridge. Get out! Where's his Susa? His Susa, he yelled. Nita shrugged her shoulders, picked up the bowl and spoon, and left. Later, she fixed Doc, she fixed Doc some lunch. He'll just go crazy again, Nita. Better leave him alone, Max warned. He's helped us, Max. When Nita offered him food, Doc shoved it away. Jesusa! Jesusa! he bellowed. Doc, listen to me, Nita said matter-of-factly. Your wife and children are dead. The Japs killed them. We're sorry they died, Doc, but the sooner you accept this, the better off you'll be. It's best to bury the dead and get on with life. I know it's real hard, Doc. I know how you feel. Doc's dark eyes flicked wildly around the room, latching onto me. Amalia, call your mother right now. His voice had such a tone of desperation. That's Yvonne, Doc. Yvonne Makarai, the, engi the engineer's child. That's not your girl, Nita explained. Your family's gone, Doc. Doc covered his ears with his hands and shook his head. He began gnashing his teeth and contorting his body so that we wondered if he was having a seizure. A girl in church had a seizure once, and Doc looked like her, her, twisting, shaking, mouth foaming, as though possessed by the devil. I felt bad for him, and I wished I could have pretended to be his daughter to make him feel better. He eventually calmed down and lapsed into a sullen silence, but he refused to eat and talk. This went on for several days, but Nita was persistent in trying to help him. Gradually, he allowed her to groom him and spoon feed him. One day, she offered him palm wine, which lulled him into a stupor. Seeing that his violence had waned, the men freed him and continued giving him palm wine to suppress his rage. Doc, in his drunken state, remained passive, spending most of his time on the mat, asleep, or gazing at the flies in the air. One evening, however, he stumbled over to Max and in a garrulous voice shouted, Hey Max, where'd you pick up your wife? Max's crooked nose twitched, but he ignored Doc and continued polishing his rifle. Max, you second-rate motherfucking Matt boxer, I'm talking to you. Where'd you find Nita? Her titties are up to here. He straightened out his arms in front of himself. She's a whore, Max. A mistress of what was his name again? Kong King King, or was it King Kong King? Max's expression changed from one of annoyance to that of an angry carabao. His nostrils flared and his shoulders humped upward as he got up from the bench and he walked over to Doc Meniez, who was weaving about. With his right hand, Mac, Mac steadied the doctor as he gave him a powerful left punch. Nita screamed, Max, he's suffering. He called you a bad name, mumbled Max as he returned to his bench. What of it? Nita shrugged and helped Doc up. You act like you're proud of it. Max ran his hand through his head in a gesture of embarrassment. Nita faced Max. Her narrow waist accentuated her big bosom and wide hips. Her abundant hair, usually knotted at her nape, was loose that night and it flew wildly around her. I, all of us, could not keep from watching her. Hands to her waist, with her armpit hair speaking out, she growled, Listen, Max. I was 17 when Mama and I moved in with Ong King King. It was the only way I could take care of Mama. I told you that when we met. You can say this or that about me, but I'm no hypocrite. I'm not proud of what I did, nor am I ashamed. Turning her attention back to the doctor, she wiped off the blood trickling down his mouth. Doc staggered up. I've treated your kind with VD so many times. Shut up, Doc, Nita ordered as she shoved him back to the bench. Did you hear me, Max? Your wife spread her legs for Kong King King or whatever that Chinese immigrant's name is. Who knows, there may have been other men. Max snorted. Papa held him back. Pushing Nita aside, Doc sta staggered toward Max and Papa. He became more aggressive, like a wound up top that he just released. Let him go, Nando. Come on, Max. Come on, Max. Nita's a whore. Come on, Max. Hit me. Are you afraid, Max? Hit me. Hit me. Please, Max, hit me, please. Max scratched his head with an uncertainty that made me hold my breath. Then he went to Doc. I thought he'd throw him another left punch, but the boxer put his arms around Doc Minez and hugged him.
Doc went limp in Max's arms and he whimpered, they're dead and it's my fault, Max. I should have been there, would have killed them, ripped them apart. The baby, not even a year. She was toddling, just a little thing. Pappy, she called me. My pappy.